So when I give lectures, it never happens that people are sad before it's gone and passed. <laughs> I can, let's start. So, for, uh, dear members of Proisi, dear friends, dear all, it is obviously a very, very special pleasure to welcome Professor Dr. Michel Mayor from the University of Geneva. I don't know if it's necessary to introduce you, but I will still do it. So, because I learn always when I meet you, I learn very astonishing things. For example, did you know that Michel actually, so he did his studies in Lausanne, and then he moved to the University of Geneva for the PhD, but he was working on the spiral, the theory of spiral density waves back then. So full theory, hardcore theoretician, Boltzmann equation, Poisson, Boltzmann equation. But he had the idea that, okay, this theory for the waves in the galaxies implies some velocities of stars. And uh, one could measure that in principle. Right? So this is how he then connected to the idea that he could actually build a spectrograph that could measure these things and test these theories. And that's how he got into, into instrumentation. And this was in 71. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So then Michel studied a lot of global, star, uh, global clusters, double stars. Actually, one of these papers were for a long time more cited than, than the paper on 51 peg. And then finally, uh, in 89, uh, there was the construction of a new spectrograph, which was called LUD, which then was installed at the Observatoire de in a very nice place, if you ever have a chance to go there, you can go there. Uh, and there they suddenly noticed that with a precision of about 30 meters per second, uh, now it would be possible to also find planets instead of just studying just I think. Uh, the rest is history. So uh, in uh, 1994, you ask for time to observe at, at OHP, and already relatively soon afterwards, you make the discovery of 51 pages. And we all know this planet. Uh, maybe just also there was more afterwards. In 2003, this was then uh, the second next generation of the spectrograph. This was HARPS, which is still the most precise radial velocity machine we have, which has also Except espresso, <laughs> which is very important for this question. I think uh, that's I said already. You know what? Two thousand nineteen, obviously, at the Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, we are. <laughs> so, what you did is for the for the field, but I would say even for the whole society is really incredible. Also for myself, I don't know how our institute, how my personal life would look like without what you have done. And therefore, Michel, thank you very, very much for coming here to this presentation. Thank you very much. This is my own son. Yes, it's true. Because in academic sense. <laughs> because uh, Willy Benz, the past director of this institute, was my first PhD student. <laughs> No, she is a student. <laughs> he was a student for me. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here because we have a long, long tradition of collaboration between, between Bern and Geneva in the field of planets. And very compl compl complementary. It's, we are not doing the same things. I will try to explain a little bit to this. So before, a, li a little bit of history. So we are not the first to, to look for the possibility of other world in the universe. Already you have this very famous letter of, of Epicurus uh, more than 2,000 years ago where he explained his strong feeling that worlds are in an infinite number and so on. Some of them similar, some different from others. Not, not bad. He made it 2,000 years ago, to six years. And later, a little bit further in the same letter, he said, living species, planted as a visible thing, could exit in some worlds and could not in other one. So we are still, you have to prove the second part of this. <laughs> the first one is made, it's okay. And this was already discussed before. So we can say, okay, it was a philosophical dream and so 
Yes, yes, but uh, okay, it was not planet. It was well, it was more not so well defined. But uh, before Demarcrit uh, made the, uh, the proposal that matter is formed by, from atom, and so Epicurus say why nature will only form one world combining different atoms and not an infinite number. So it's not sure science, but it's not too far. Right? Good ideas. And so, and after during the last 2,000 years, this idea, I, I, can, I can say, I don't know, one abhorrent situation, I don't know. But I will say only uh, at least two or three. Uh, the theologian Albertus Magnus, uh, from Germany, did this is very good for us, for ego. Do they exist many worlds or they but a single one? This is one of the most noble and exalted questions in the study of nature. For us, it's nice to have this kind of situation. And, and you have the same 13th century, you have the Archbishop from Paris, uh, with the agreement of the Pope, uh, ask the question if he can teach the hypothesis of the plurality of world in the Sorbonne. So you see, it was absolutely a very general idea all along the last 2,000 years. And why we have the feeling that it was not the case is this was coming from the from the study, so from the story of Giordano Bruno in the early 17th century, because he died, he was born in Rome, uh, and he wrote a book uh, on the existence of, of multiplanetary system. It's, uh, you say, the sun is a star like others, it's simply brighter because closer, and as uh, the other star should have uh, planets. So it was theologian, he was not a scientist, but he was correct. And he was not burned for this, but for theological reason. So, okay, you see that you have a lot of, of comments you can do, <coughs> but it's not a place for to do it. So, and you see that, so, the, the, the <coughs> hypothesis or the proposal made by Giordano Bruno was in 1600. But already a little bit less, no, a little bit more than 100 years later, it was just, just started <laughs> to be popular. And you see this atlas of Doppelmeier in 1742, and if you are looking on the upper right corner, so you see that you have distant stars, you have the solar system in the middle, and then, if you look, have a look, you see the distant stars are all already surrounded by uh, multiplanetary system. So this was common in the, in, in the general public, I would say. So, no, stop history. Uh, okay, as you know, we are living in the Milky Way, the galaxies is a composite picture made by the Gaia satellite. And this, you have, I hope you have seen yourself this strip of light, uh, as uh, seen by Galileo 400 years ago, and this is just a superposition of many, many stars, let's say, let's say order of magnitude, two billion stars, and immediately you have the question, how many Earth twin planets uh, in this system? It's huge. For the light will need something like 100,000 years to go from one side to another one. So it's it's incredibly larger than the solar system. If you took a modern telescope and look a very small piece of the sky, a little bit above the, the plane of the Milky Way, this is what you see. The, this is, the problem is not to discover new stars. You have too many stars. The problem is do we have the capability to detect planetary systems uh, or this star, yeah, or this one, and so on. So do we have the capability to do it? And a little bit back on history. If you look back to the last 20th century, and you see the estimation made on the 
expect or other. Estimated number of planetary systems in the Milky Way made by big names of the astro astronomy, Sir Jean, Chaplin for the Cambridge, Chaplin in Harvard, and so on. So you see, for during the first half of the 20th century, the astronomers do not believe that we have other planetary system in the Milky Way. We are alone. And suddenly the ideas change in the middle of the 20th century, and uh, after we jump to million, billion, hundreds of billion of planetary system, and the present uh, measurement confirms that we are at the level of 100 billion or something like this. And this was a, a change of the, uh, of the physics, because uh, from Kant and Laplace, uh, it was, we knew that all planet was in the plane, orbiting in the same direction, and already Laplace and Kant said that all this planet was formed from a nebula. And the problem, the nebula is coming from what? From where? And during the first part of the century, the theory was wrong. It was believed that it was due to the close encounter of two stars. So when the two stars go, go very close, you have a strong tidal interaction, and you, you take part of the envelope, you form the disk, and so on, and this was supposed to be the, the place to form new, new planetary system. And it's evident you can calculate the probability of such a thing happen at its zero. 200 billion stars in 10 billion years, no encounter like this. So this is the reason why these people with this very small expectation. And suddenly, in the middle, first for a different reason, it's not important, but then after for a good reason made by Otto Struve, that he did a very strange thing, apparently without any relationship, that stars like the sun, <coughs> low mass stars, do not rotate quickly. And when you have the collapse of a big cloud, you have always a huge turbulence. You have always an excess of angular momentum. So normally, stars, the low mass stars, like the sun and so on, should rotate it extremely quickly. It is not the case, and Otto Struve say, oh, this is the reason why we have planets, because the excess of angular momentum was expelled to form this disk of, of uh, matter. And the idea changed drastically, just in 1952, not so old. And he said, we should have an infinite, not an infinite, but a huge number of planetary systems in the Milky Way. It's the reason why that we are, we are at a very high level after. It's a logarithmic scale. Are you? So, ideas that along the, the arm, the spiral arm in the galaxy, you have a lot of huge clouds called molecular clouds, relatively low temperature cloud, and, but it's a huge, huge cloud. This, uh, this is the Orion Nebula, you know very well. It's uh, about 100,000 times the mass of the sun, so it's a really big cloud. And sometimes you have collapse of this cloud and the formation of new generation of stars. And due to the argument given by Struve, I said this is also the nursery for the formation of planets, planetary system. And this was first suspected from the theory, then from the excess of infrared luminosity of young stars, and after directly observed by the Hubble Space Telescope. In 1995, you have the, again the Orion Nebula here, and the high resolution uh, possible with the Hubble Space Telescope, that they observe few of these stars just going out of the nebula. And you see that all of them, or a lot of them, are surrounded by a disk of dust and gas. And this is exactly the source of the formation of planetary system. So from that time, we can suspect that almost stars should have planetary system. Go back to the same picture. <laughs> the problem, how to detect this planet? Just uh, one remark. If you let imagine you 
take some distance to the solar system, you have the sun, you have a planet, like let's say the Earth, and you have what is the relation, the ratio of the luminosity between the sun and the Earth? One billion. So if you are at some distance, you are extremely close, no chance to see the planet. You are completely dominated by the luminosity of the star. Jupiter is not be better. So you have to develop a new kind of techniques. And one possibility, success is already some time ago, but, but before we have the precision needed for that, that if the star, no, if the planet orbit around here, the star itself will have a small wobble around the gravity center of the system. Evidently, as a star is much heavier than the planet, the, the, gravity, <coughs> the gravity of the system is close to the star, so the, the wobble of the star is very small. So if, but let's imagine you have a spectrograph able to measure the velocity. At some moment, the star is moving away <coughs> in a new direction and so on. So by the Doppler effect, you can measure the change of the velocity, and the nature will help you in this because the spectrum is full of atomic transition. So all the game will be to measure the oscillation of this forest of line, and you have to adapt it. some technique, optical technique, to try to concentrate all the information distributed in this, all this line to have a precise measurement. Uh, yes, it's small. This the problem is only because it's really small. <coughs> uh, as we have developed with colleagues from France, this a new spectrograph with a nice stability, and uh, we start a measurement to to explore the domain of low mass companion to stars. Uh, it was so we have some interest for the class of what is called. Brown dwarfs. It was at the time it was not so well known, and so on. And giant planet. But giant planet was suspected to have only to only have possibility of period larger than ten years. So he say, okay, ten years is long. So it would be nice to to measure also to discover other things like brown dwarfs and so on. So it was the reason we we mentioned both in the application in the term application. And suddenly appear a strange object because the velocity was changing like we were expecting. And, uh, but the problem was that the, if the mass is about half the mass of Jupiter, in the period was only 4.2 days. Let's imagine Jupiter orbit hosted by the sun and rotating in only four days. It's so close to the star. And this was something like 1,000 times smaller than the theoretical predictions. Because you need to agglomerate this. I have to be careful because it's a, it's a place where they are doing this kind of physics. Mm -hmm. You have to need to agglomerate ice particles. And so ice particles exist only far, far away from the stars. So this was the basic argument to why we, have, we should have long period. And this was not the case. So it's one good reason to be careful before publications. And here you have uh, <coughs> part of the answer. And the fact that when you form the new planet in the disk of dust and gas, you collect the matter. But also after the mass of the planet will stimulate the, some excess of matter to the resonance in the disk and you have some excess of matter. And the reaction of this excess of matter to the orbit of the planet will create some change of the orbit. And you have a shrinking. And uh, it's very strange because uh, the answer was already existing before the discovery of 51 peg, but observers do not read papers by, by, by theoreticians. <laughs> and so do not people believe before that we could have short period and you see some people have contributed here to, this, uh, to these things. And the, the answer was published by Lynn and colleagues in 96, just after the discovery of 51 peg. 
of the, of the city states are more complicated to us to what I said. So going back to my own hobby, uh, after, <coughs> after LOD, the spectrograph having allowed the discovery of 51 back, we start to build, to develop a new generation of spectrograph. And 20 years ago, almost exactly, we, the, we built the ARP spectrograph uh, and already from 20 years on the 3.6 meter telescope at La Silla. It's a vacuum spectrograph, a very high term, control thermal and so on. So the precision is about one meter per second. So you see when the change of the velocity is uh, is at the level of one meter per second. So good sensitivity. And it is work very, very well. It is uh, the site where it is put is uh, in the big dome here, the 3.6 meter telescope in north of Chile, at, uh, in, the, uh, in about 600 kilometers north of Santiago. So what we are doing with this? Having built, developed this instrument, uh, okay, you have to pay the material, you have to pay ultimate power, and you give, at the end, you give the instrument to, to, to ESO. But the reward is nights. You receive a, a, a huge number of observing nights uh, as a compensation for that. And, uh, okay, so what we did, we, we received quite a lot. 500 nights of a big telescope, so it's, well, it's good. And uh, so it was a big team with parent colleagues, because you need a lot of people to, to do all this. 100 nights every year, you know? And uh, so we start to measure. It's, it's very awfully boring. You take the telescope, you measure the velocity of the star, another one, another one, a few days after, we repeat, we measure the velocity, and so on, and so on. And they are doing this during several years. And what you, you see here after four years, this is clump of fire. And you see that it's something like this. The velocity versus time is changing. And you see that if you let the computer to analyze a little bit these things, you see that you have three planets, and this was the first system with three Neptune-type planets uh, already 15 years ago or something like this. So this is typically what we are doing for a huge sample of stars in the southern sky. Sometimes it's more complicated. Here is the same plot, the velocity versus time. Every time you, have, you made a measurement, the red dots here, so you can notice that at least we can anticipate one planet with a period of something like seven years. Okay. But then, after you see, say, you have, the precision is one meter per second, and it's, you see, the scatter is few meters per second. So, it's, it's, okay, maybe the, the measurements are bo not so good. So, maybe you have some other planet, a small period, and so on. So, you let the computer to do the things, to analyze how many planets you have, not, fit, not easy to do it. And the net result at the end is seven planets here. And worse, that one is with about one day, 1.5 mass, six days, 13 mass, 16 days, 11 mass. A huge number of low mass planets. <coughs> we do not have this. And more uh, later on, we have discovered that the, mo the most frequent planet we have discovered are planets with mass between one and 10 times the mass of the Earth, not existing in the solar system. So this, and it's, it's very interesting because there is, the center is very packed. You see, the, here, this is extremely <coughs> dense in the center, and we have, evidently we have been afraid that it could be unstable. But happily, we have some help from people able to understand the dynamics of this complex system. So what after 20, 25 years of measurement? Not only for us, but many teams were measuring this thing. So what we have discovered is a huge <coughs> of exoplanetary system. They are not all comparable to the solar system. Period as short of few hours. Some period smaller than the mass of the Earth or much, much larger. 
orbital eccentricity sometimes 0.93. So orbit like this. In the solar system, it's almost circular. And so on and so on. Some orbits, okay, in the solar system, you, the sun is rotating like this, and the planet orbit in the same direction. We have discovered planet orbiting in the wrong direction. And some with a completely crazy inclination. And so on and so on. You have a huge diversity of planetary systems. So this is uh, exhibit the, the huge complexity of the mechanism of the formation and the evolution of our planetary system. And again, we collaborate with people from Bern. If, if we are observing so many stars in the, in the southern sky, we start to try to have some good statistics and to have a statistic between mass and semi-major axis. Uh, and after you can put all the physics you believe to be correct for the formation of planetary system, and you can create an artificial uh, diagram with planet uh, metal and silicon, water type, and gases planet the color red, blue, and green. And after to start to, observe, to, to, to compare with observations and to see if the theory is discrepant or if you have to change something and so on. So this is a second point where we collaborate with people from Bern and with people from, from Santa Cruz and Japan. They are always the same people. So uh, as we observe this kind of crazy planet on a short period, the, the, the nice uh, byproduct of this is that if you have a star like this and a planet orbiting so close to the star, you have a good chance to have an eclipse. We call transit. So simply, the planet cross the disk of the star, and you have a small dip of the luminosity, periodic dip. And in 1999, we discovered a planet with a period of 3.5 days, so still a little closer to the star. and. Uh, uh, we were collaborating with a uh, few people from the US and uh, Tim Brown, working at Boulder, used a very big telescope. It was a 10 centimeter telescope in his garage because he was uh, so amateur uh, in, uh, 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 in addition to his professional work. And uh, he looked the star we mentioned and exactly at the same moment predicted by the observation of velocities, uh, Charbonneau and Brown observe a decrease by something one and a half, two percent of the luminosity. So this was the first transit in September 1999. And it is this, this colleague has a very clever idea to say, oh, it will be nice to observe, to repeat the measurement above the atmosphere and they use the Hubble Space Telescope and remeasure exactly the same object. The change of sky is not really because it's the same level, it's just the image But you see the quality you can have when you are out of the atmosphere. So immediately what you say, oh, we can try to find Earth-type planet. Because this is a giant planet. It's a, this is also a very historically important of this measurement. Still at the time, some people, some colleagues, do not believe it was planet. And we, at the time, we already have quite a lot. And uh, so if you have the Doppler effect measures the mass, the transit gives the size, so it's not too difficult to measure the mean density of the planet. And the mean density was 0.3 gram per cubic centimeter. So it's about half the density of Saturn. So there was a direct proof that it was a gaseous giant planet. And so it was so nice that after you have a lot of development. And this cartoon gives a, an idea of what we can dream for that. When the planet is in front, you have the, uh, yes, the relative size of the planet in the top, the contrast of the 
When the planet is behind, you have access to the temperature of the atmosphere in the infrared of the atmosphere of the planet. Uh, and, but what is the most interesting part is uh, this small ring here. The atmosphere of the planet with filter la luminosity coming from the star, and when you compare the spectrum in front and behind, you have access to the small change of the spectra due to the atmosphere of the planet. So you can start to do the chemical analysis of the composition of planet. I will explain this. How you can. This is probably the most, the best goal for the next decade. This is probably, the first 25 years was discovery, now it's atmosphere. So, a little bit more complicated. Alors, I will start from the example I gave here. Let's imagine that the Earth crosses the disk of the Sun. And you observe the contrast of the, of the deep in the visible. Okay, you have a measurement. And now you repeat the measurement in at 9.7 micron. This is the wavelength of the ozone. And the ozone is completely blocked at 30 kilometers or 35 kilometers of altitude. So in the domain of the ozone wavelengths, the Earth looks a little bit bigger. So you can repeat the measurement to a lot, a lot, a lot of different wavelengths. And simply, you can start to do spectroscopy by simply looking at the contrast of the deep. And this gives the possibility to do the chemical analysis of planets. And see, with this, you overcome the difficulty of the huge contrast between the star and the planet. Because the direct visit is not possible. To do directly the, the spectrum of a planet, it's really difficult. Just with this, you can do it. And already, uh, a lot of different chemical compounds have been discovered. I have not finished the list. It's a huge list of molecules. And the space, James Webb uh, discovered a new one uh, recently. It's impossible not to mention the huge harvest of discovery made by the Kepler space mission. And this is, the idea is, is absolutely simple. You have the Earth. You have the Kepler satellite. You look in the direction of the sky where you have plenty of stars. You, you made every few minutes a picture. Oh, during several years, you take pictures of the same field of stars. So at the end of that say, three years, you have a series of thousands of electronic pictures. And you put all this stuff in the, with maybe 100,000 stars in the picture, and you start to analyze this series of measurements. And sometimes you see that one, the luminosity of one star is like this. So happy, you have discovered a star with a planet. And you put a plot, uh, a simple black one, let's say 10 years, one day. So every you have made a discovery like this, you have uh, you put a plot. Let's imagine now sometimes you have look, 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 and so on. So you see you have two planets. So you, in such case you you put the symbols in this kind of here. Okay. And then and then after you comp complete. And sometimes you have six Sometimes you have six planets, and so on. So you see, multi-planetary systems are extremely, extremely common. And this is a huge harvest of discovery. And it, it, for people working at, on the ground night after night to find a planet. OK, these have arrived with thousands of planets. So going back to the, so the only point with Kepler, that the Kepler field was in the north. And R shows in the source, hemisphere, source on hemisphere. So we have been obliged to duplicate the instrument and install 
another one in La Palma Observatory, exactly the same instrument, and with a specific goal to put all the power of this instrument to, to object with the smallest contrast. Smallest contrast, this is correspond to smallest planet. So we try to explore the domain <coughs> of we have here radius in terms of Earth's radius versus the mass. And you see this if it's a planet like the Venus and Earth, Venus and Earth, it, if it's silicate and metals, they will be on a relationship like this. And if it's a, a planet made only from water, it will be something like this. If it's only iron, it will be here. Yeah. So uh, you see that below may, maybe four, five times the mass of the Earth, most of the planet discovered are rocky planet. And after everything, you have atmosphere, so start much, much bigger, and so on. So a huge number of nights are devoted to explore this problem, we start to do physics of planets. And uh, the key to detect low mass planet is precision. So you need to develop a new spectrograph with highest and highest precision. And after ARPS, uh, we have developed a new spectrograph with the capability to collect the light for four eight meter telescope and Parana Observatory underground, or we can work with one telescope also. And this was made under the leadership of Francesco Pepe in Geneva, but also with the collaboration with our colleague from Bern and uh, and other Spain, Italy, and so on. It's a big instrument. It was it was uh, okay more expensive and more work. <laughs> So, and the goal of this instrument was to achieve 10 centimeters per second. Why this precision? Because the reflex motion of the sun due to the motion of the Earth is something like 10 centimeters per second. So if we want to, uh, to attack the domain of rocky planet not too close to the star, we need to have this kind of precision and he is working from three, four, five years, and it works. And for example, uh, with, mostly with ARPS, a first planet was discovered with a period of 11 days, two years ago, and with, uh, with Espresso, uh, our colleagues have discovered a period of five days, and a mass only a quarter of the mass of the Earth. So, okay, we can start with it. The only problem is that the period is five days, okay. It's not what we want. <laughs> so, what we want is to, to, to find planet maybe closer to, to the possibility to be habitable, so to have liquid water and the surface and so on, and maybe not too close to the star to avoid uh, strong magnetic or arc phenomena and things like this. So the question behind is, do we have the possibility to find Earth twins and maybe to address the problem of life? Is, it, is life a cosmic imperative? What is the meaning of this sentence? If you have all the good condition, as life will appear as a natural byproduct of the, of the evolution of the universe. Nobody knows. You have some people believe that we are alone. Some say, no, maybe uh, life is a normal pro pro process in, okay. with maybe a lot of difficulty of <coughs> going trade, but you, you start from two billion planetary system, or I don't know, a huge number. So what is the reason? We don't know. We don't know. We have, we can, uh, you can find books claiming that we are alone in terms of life, and some other books know we have life everywhere. So okay. let the measurement. What is the difficulty? This is a picture of the sun, dirty, a convective zone, magnetic activity, and this is the Earth. And you, at the same scale. So you dream to see the contrast of the transit when the Earth crosses the disk, 
or the reflex motion of the star of the, when the, the small Earth uh, perturbs its velocity. This is the difficulty. Uh, so uh, we, we know every, uh, perfectly that the stability of the Earth's atmosphere is much worse than this precision. So some colleagues start to need a clever instrument, a small telescope, uh, with the capability to measure the sun all the days and to feed the R spectrograph in Canary Island. So at night you measure the sun, at night stars, and you can analyze the velocity of the sun like it is a star. And this is the result after a few, few <laughs> hundred days. And you see the velocity of the sun is not perfect due to this magnetic activity of the sun. So you are looking for something like 10 times smaller than this. So a lot of people have worked on this problem, how you can decrease the noise. And for example, this made by Meron, that after good software improvement, they arrived to 0.5 meters per second. So it's not the level of the, what we need, but if you have a lot of measurement, maybe you can arrive to the, to the level of Earth's detection of Venus. And this, uh, some, a lot of groups are working on this problem right now. And for example, one young student having made his PhD last year in Geneva, start to take into account the fact that all the lines, from, uh, atomic lines in the atmosphere of the sun are not affected by the same level of magnetic activity. So he take into account this physics in his correlation process, and he reanalyzed all the measurement data during 20 years with our, because we have archives, we have all these things. And here, you see that you can see the black dots are all the detected planets. Amplitude versus period in days here. So every dot here corresponds to a planetary system. And reanalyzing this with a new software, it detects something 30 low mass planets from this material. So, okay, no, it's candidate, we need to reconfirm to be sure because small amplitude, but what is interesting? That here at level, this is the Earth. So you see that we have, we have holes, we are not too far. The level is about 10 centimeters, this is 30 centimeters, it's not so bad. Okay, and, and you see the progress is huge. And if we have the same plot but express, in terms of, of mass versus period, all the stars, black stars, correspond to all these candidates coming from this new approach. And you see, it's not too far from the Earth. Okay. Real Earth, twin. So the goal is to identify new targets for future space mission and to, to do the chemical analysis of the atmosphere and to find some whole set of molecules related to the problem, it's what's called biosignature. So molecules related to the life, at least what we believe to be the form of life. Okay. The, 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 the atmosphere of the Earth is really small compared to the Earth. So if you want to see the change of the spectrum when the planet is in front of BI. It's so small. So still today, the James Webb do not have the capability to do it. It will arrive to the maybe three times the mass of the Earth. So it's not easy. But OK, we can also try to do something from the ground. And there, this uh, the plot here, when I start to do astronomy, the, the, the record was a L. Uh, telescope at Palomar, it was 5.08 meter, 5 meter telescope. And this is the size. Okay. 
okay? And after you can see all the new telescope detected, for example, you have uh, here Kadaria, Kadari, K, and so on, so on. You can recognize several, the four VLT in the class telescope. And the, the telescope right now in development in Chile with a diameter of 39 meters. Diameter, okay, so one, not, not a single dish, it's a, it's a composite of hexagon and so on. And this is not fiction, it's expected to, to 2028. It was delayed by some COVID. This is, it's simply incredible. And this was made, the fiction was made in January last year, so about one year ago. And if you have good eyes, you can look. Here, you have two people discussing here. Just to have the size of these things. It's completely crazy. <coughs> and, it, and, and worse, well, I love this story. Uh, it worse is located in one of the worst system, seismic places in the world. It's close to the Atacama Fault in the north of Chile, and uh, in, in 1960s in Concepcion, they probably what was the largest earthquake of the 20th century. And the 800 kilometers north of Chile are still waiting to, 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 to crash. And they, you can measure the tension in the fault and they increase. But nevertheless, the quality of the site is such that they choose to say, okay, this is a technical problem, we have to solve it, but the quality of the sky is the most important point. And I discussed with the boss of the, of the construction, and he, he mentioned that they have some engineers putting some sensor a few kilometers from here. And when you have the longitudinal wave of the seismic activity arrive, they have time to send the message to increase the widths of some hydromagnetic, I don't know, okay, the, 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 the oil spacing different pieces of the, of the mechanics, or to put airbag for some place and so on, so they pretend they can solve the problem of maybe uh, earthquake of uh, magnitude 9 or something like this. So, okay, we will see. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, yeah. not to forget the James Webb telescope, a small telescope, only 6.5 meters but in the space. So, uh, presently, it's already giving a lot of beautiful things. And I have to thank you. journey, I would say, from, uh, yeah, from this whole story. Thank you very, very much. Uh, it's a pleasure because uh, we collaborate if we're between Bern and Geneva from and with Doug yes. <laughs> on the other side of the earth. <laughs> Questions, please. Yes. You mentioned a planet with a retrograde orbit. How can this be seen <coughs> from a spectrogram? Aha, yes. Excellent. Uh, okay. Uh, you have, when you have stars like this, rotating stars like this, you have part of the star so, giving light moving in your direction, and the other part moving in the other direction. So the net result, that the, the mean, when you measure, it's the mean of the all the, the light coming from the star. Let's imagine that you have a transit, and the planet block part of the light coming from one side. So you have a small error of the velocity. And when the planet is moving like this, you have a changing shape of the error. So after you analyze the change, and if the star and the planet cross exactly the, the equatorial plane, you will have a signature like this. But if the planet cross 
with a different angle. So maybe the part on this hemisphere is smaller and will be larger here. So you have the possibility to measure the angle between the orbital plane and the equatorial plane of the star. It's fascinating to see. You still not see the planet, but you can measure through such small things like this. And this is very nice because this effect was discovered and proposed in 1924, by, uh, not for planets, for binary stars, by uh, Rossiter and McLaughlin, independently two papers. And in 1940, and I, I don't know exactly, but I believe it, the impact of this paper was so nothing during almost one century or a little bit less. And suddenly, with planet, all people rediscover Rossiter McLaughlin effect and so on. So, sometimes when you are doing something, you have to wait one century before to see the impact. <laughs> Questions, please. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. You showed us a distribution of possible planets and uh, their elements they have. And there are some having 100% iron. Do you know which type of uh, examples you could keep for that. Can you remember one of the plots? Is this a, just a model or? Yeah, this, this, the set of lines you have yeah, seen exactly. in the beginning, so this is typically theoretical work made by geophysicists. Okay. So you, you do this ex exercise, let imagine that you have a, a, a planet from only from iron, you put all you know what you know on the, on the physics of iron at high compression and so on, and you set the relationship between uh, radius and mass. And then after you can repeat the experiment with different kinds of composition. It's not, it's not easy because the pressure at the inside could be terribly, uh, in physics, not so easy to, to build. And then, so you, you have a set of lines like this, and then after you, you have radius and mass, so you put the plot and see, and you see where they are located. Yes, sir. So, so looking at the chemistry of the atmospheres, we, we try to learn something about biological processes, right? And how far have we evolved with, with that technique? Do we, do we already have candidates of plants where we think, well, there could be some, some biology down there? No. For the moment, it's really the infancy, it's the beginning. Because this technique was, gave results for the giant planet for uh, gases, giant planets, like Jupiter and type planets, or things like this. So we don't have any, any uh, significant results related to the biology <coughs> or to chemistry of rocky planets. No. We have to wait. So my, my answer on this question is that uh, we, we, the question was expressed more than 2,000 years ago. We can wait 25 years more. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Um, there were some observations from Ulysses of the Earth. Did they learn something about the atmosphere there, which we could use to look for... Oh, the, the atmosphere of Venus and Earth? Yeah, and Earth. Oh, they are completely different. It's completely different. This is was related with the, with the mass versus radius, but not to the atmosphere. As we know that... The, the atmosphere of Venus and is nothing comparable to what is to, to the Earth. Ninety-six percent of carbon dioxide in, in Venus. I don't know, five hundred Kelvin or no, degrees Celsius. So it's awfully. It's completely different. Oh, this is really only related to the uh, density, to the to the to the planet, and not to the atmosphere. Over there, please. <laughs> First one and then the other. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, this new paper that you mentioned from 22, the re new reduction of the Harps data, are some of these uh, lower mass planets by chance into a transiting system or still no? I'm not sure. I, have to, I missed maybe part of the question. You, in the, in the new planet, the, the new planets that yes. are about point the Earth masses uh, studies are if they are transiting or 
it's too complicated to get. No, no, I believe. But as, a, as far as I know, that the, the, the few people involved in this development of software, uh, Cretinier and Dumusque and other people, know I have, what they have. They have applied to have time with Espresso to, to be sure that they are, it's really, it's really planet. And probably the second step, they, they will try to, to and maybe f maybe we can find some uh, already existing results in, because all these objects probably are relatively bright. So maybe some of them <coughs> are already part of the test mission uh, with uh, mostly stars brighter than 10 or something like this. So, but it's quite recent, it's, uh, so. But I have to mention this is not the only work in this kind of thing. You have the group of Edinburgh, I show the work, but you have in the state, you have several groups, you have, uh, uh, you have in England, uh, in other places, in Oxford, you have people working on that. And uh, I, what I like very much is the approach made by Cretinier is the fact he was not only a matica, mathematic filtering of the measurement, yeah. but is putting some physics inside. He yeah. discovered that the, for, uh, the some lines are formed at some level in the, in the atmosphere, and so they are more sensitive to the change of the magnetic activity. So they, he tried to eliminate the, or take into account these things, and so and then to, to improve the quality, and it works. And since the next result is this approach, more physical approach is, is, is working. Now we have to wait a little bit to see if they can really confirm the subject. So um, you mentioned the, the next generation of telescopes, the ELTs, and my impression is that those and the next generation of space telescopes is going to be a revolution in imaging planets, right? So I was wondering what your perspective is for how radial velocities will be useful in the next decades, or will we move to being able to image? Um, no, image, uh, okay, uh, you have some group, I'm not speaking at all, you have some group trying to do clever techniques <coughs> to do images of planets. So uh, already they have succeeded to do it, but the first discoveries was mostly very massive distant planets. And it is, it is interesting, but how, how, what is the matter you, you, you have to form a planet so big so far? So it's also interesting by itself. But a planet related to life, close to the star, low mass planet, okay, we are very, very far to have images of these things. But it's interesting, it's, but it's different. It's, it's a little bit different of, of this context. But you have a huge effect. Huge effort to do imagery, yes. Yeah, following a little bit the line of you uh, about imaging or trying to directly detect uh, Earth like planets, what, what do you think about the, the future uh, big projects or initiatives like LIFE, for example? Yes, this is a uh, new renewal of the. Old Darwin TPF uh, proposal 25, 30 years ago. So the idea is to have uh, spacecraft at some distance and to do interferometry and to, to, to try to analyze directly the chemistry of uh, planets by using this. Because if you have 100, of, I don't know, life, what is the distance of the interferometer, let's say 100 meters, so you start to have a huge resolution. Out of the space, so you have no turbulence and so on. It's not easy, but maybe you are, you have a, you can access to the direct chemical spectrum of the of the planet. <coughs> so I believe it's, it's. I'm very happy to see, let's say, to renew this idea because I remember my first conference after the discovery of 51 Peg was in Capri in summer. 96. Not awful place, but okay. But uh, it was my first dire, contact after the discovery of Festival Bay with people searching life 
uh, this curve is existing. And uh, Darwin and TPF was, okay, promising. Well, people was extremely enthusiastic for the future. And, uh, and okay, after, after ESA and then NASA both, Decline and say, no, it's technically too complicated, and so on. Uh, and all this mission disappear. And now you have the, the work made in, in Zurich, and this is, is perfect. It's, uh, I, I do not have the competence to, 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 to see if they are really what, what are the new ideas compared to Darwin and TPF? You, 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 you cannot say a priori what is the best technique. You have to, to push everything. For example, you have a nice, you have uh, Andres. This is a new instrument to be put on the 39 meter telescope. And the idea is to have high optical resolution, adaptive optics, and coupled with high spectral resolution. So, in the image of the star at very high resolution, you analyze place by place the image, and you see that maybe some place you have a small difference, and with cross correlation in the high spectral, you have maybe the possibility to, to do the spectra of planet much closer to the star. So, and this already in Geneva, we have a, a, a group having developed Ristretto. It's a team. Italian history, <laughs> you have espresso, ristretto, and this is, a, is, a, is a, uh, uh, an, in, an instrument to, to explore this kind of concept already on an 8 meter telescope before the, the big telescope and to, to see if it works, if we can do something and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michel. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. All invited, of course.